Hello, this is Ryan Ray of AAII, and I am the host of the Individual Investor Show. We are talking about the latest and greatest from the world of finance and investing for the individual investor. We're broadcasting, and if you're watching this in the archive, we post our upcoming live show schedule on AAII.com slash webinars, and members do have full access to the full ar archive of shows. My guests today are Charles Rotblut and Wayne Thorpe of AAII, and Shelly Ant Antonevich of the Investment Company Institute. Today's show has three topics. First, we're going to get into a preview of our mutual fund and ETF guide and talk about the latest trends that we've, we've been seeing. We'll be talking to uh, Shelly to explain the difference uh, between mutual funds and ETFs and how you may be able to uh, investigate and analyze the two. And finally, in our third segment, we're going to have uh, Wayne on to discuss the quality grade in our quant screener to, determine, to help you determine if a stock is attractive and how to determine better quality stocks versus other quality stocks in this tool. Plus, our listener mailbag section, we re-answer questions that are submitted to us. Let's get started. Charles, I wanted to bring you on to talk about the mutual fund and ETF guide for the February issue of the AAI Journal. This was the first year we've published uh, both guides in the same issue. What was the reasoning for doing so? Yeah, sure, Ryan. We published the mutual fund guide. This is actually our 40th edition of the mutual fund guide, so it goes back a long ways. Uh, for our ETF guide, this is the 19th annual edition, so a long history with both. Um, we've, tr we've traditionally published our mutual fund guide uh, in February, I actually think it originally might have even come out in March because of printing deadlines. Uh, our ETF guides actually bounced around a little bit. It started off in the late fall. Uh, we moved it to August, but now we've moved it to February, uh, mainly because we've had a lot of requests from members over the years. That'd be really helpful to have both guides in one publication. That way I can actually look at both mutual funds and ETFs. Uh, and we do think investors should be somewhat indifferent as to whether or not they choose a mutual fund or an ETF. So we did this because of members. Uh, as I actually explained in the February issue, we also had a change in our data feed uh, that allowed us to introduce a lot of new tools last year, uh, but because it also accelerated the time it took us to process the data, meaning we're able to process the data a lot faster, uh, we were able now to combine both guides in a single issue of the AAII journal. So I, I guess I'm just curious, and I'm sure members also would like to know, how many funds are covered in the guides this time around? So about 400 mutual funds and about 400 ETFs are covered in the print and PDF guide. Uh, those who are willing to go online, uh, we have about over 24,000 mutual funds covered and uh, over 2,400 ETFs covered. Now, the difference between the two, because those are big differences, is there's simply many more mutual funds than ETFs. So we actually do provide information on all the U.S. exchange listed ETFs. It's just that there's a lot fewer ETFs in total than there are in total mutual funds. But it's worth noting uh, those members who have mutual funds either through an advisor or perhaps through a retirement plan at work, they'll be able to find many of those covered in the online version of our mutual fund guide. So uh, just going over those numbers, I mean, that's quite a large universe. How does one go about picking a fund that's right for them? It's not as easy as, say, um, you know, picking an appetizer off of a menu, but I think a lot of investors are looking for tips when they're making picks. Um, any tips that you might want to share with folks? Well, you've obviously never debated about which appetizer to get, I must say that. <laughs> sure. But uh, well, you know, one of the things what starts out with is really allocation. What allocation need are you trying to find? Do you need a large cap fund? Do you need an international fund? Are you looking for a bond fund? Figure that out first. And then you also want to think about what account are you buying the fund in? Uh, if you're on a 401k, chances are you're restricted to mutual funds. Uh, if you're investing through, say, a robo-advisor, you might be locked into ETFs. So, it does depend where your account is held, but beyond that, it really is about finding the best fund for your purposes. Uh, if you have a preference towards active management, and that tends to be a realm of mutual funds, uh, if you're an index investor, uh, then you have your choice. Even though there are some dis differences in expense ratios uh, between index ETFs and index mutual funds, 
Uh, generally, it's pretty small, especially when you start looking at Vanguard funds. Uh, so those are some of the things you want to consider, but certainly you have certain preferences uh, when you're looking at thematic funds, when you're looking at sector funds, uh, a lot of factor funds, those tend to be more in the realm of ETFs. Uh, if you want, again, more actively managed funds, uh, perhaps you want to do some that are doing some more specific strategies, or maybe you want a professional manager who's really digging into the balance sheets. Uh, that would be a case for mutual funds. But we think at a high level, uh, investors should really be indifferent as to whether or not it's a mutual fund or an ETF structure and really look for the best fund uh, for their needs and not worry so much about whether or not it's an ETF or a mutual fund. Charles, are there any tools that uh, ind individual investors can use, perhaps a comparison tool or a way for folks to kind of search through our website to find uh, funds and ETFs that may be appropriate for them? Yeah, absolutely. We have a lot of tools available to AI members, uh, more tools if people are an A-plus subscriber. Uh, but A-plus investors, I mentioned the online guides before. They have full access to that. Uh, those online guides are updated monthly. Uh, there's a downloadable spreadsheet. Uh, but also in the guide, you actually will see small check boxes near all the funds so you can actually select two or more funds either mutual funds or etfs and actually do a comparison uh, you can also find on our website we have a mutual fund compare tool and an etf compare tool and i love these tools because it gives you the ability to do a side-by-side -side comparison of one or more mutual funds or one or more etfs so if you're really trying to make that decision you can uh, if you look at our screening website, you look at a sorry. If you look at the screening portion of our website, uh, you look at the ideas section of our website. You'll find more tools uh, for both ETF and mutual fund investors in terms of what's working now, what's not working now. Uh, in the AI Journal, uh, we're publishing mutual fund first cuts and ETF first cuts. So we do have a realm of tools uh, to give individual investors both ideas and also means of doing analysis to find the mutual funds or ETFs that are best for their needs. Uh, finally, I just wanted to ask, um, you know, in, in publishing this, you reviewed the data. Were there any fund trends that you think are notable for individual investors? You know, there's a few. Uh, when we look at the industry, uh, for the mutual fund industry, uh, we saw indexing really taking a bigger hold. Uh, and I made this reference. I actually looked, because every year we publish the top, the 50 largest funds. Uh, so when we look at 2010, uh, Vanguard accounted for about 13 or 15 of the top 50 funds. Uh, now it accounts for over 30. So we saw this big growth. Uh, but we also saw throughout last year a lot of money coming out of mutual funds. So a lot of outflows coming out of equity-based mutual funds. Now, some of that money did find its way into bond mutual funds, uh, but we did see that huge trend away. Uh, and ETFs, uh, at an aggregate level, the total number of ETFs we see being issued um, has, seems to have kind of really stabled off. We have about 2,400, as I said, ETFs right now currently available. Uh, that number over the last year or two seems like it's kind of leveled out. Now, maybe it's a plateau. Uh, maybe the ETF industry is reaching its highest level. That remains to be seen. Uh, but what we do see uh, among ETFs, we do see more issuance, uh, which means more dollars going into ETFs. Now, not all that money is coming from mutual funds uh, because you have more institutional investors involved in ETFs than mutual funds. So not an apples to apples comparison, uh, but we are seeing money flow in the ETFs. And when we look at new ETFs, we're continuing to see this trend. Uh, most of the new ETFs being very thematic, uh, very specialized in scope. Uh, and the truth of the matter is a lot of these new ETFs don't really take hold in terms of assets. Now we always see a handful that do, but by and large, uh, those new ETFs seem to come and go. They just never seem to counter a lot of investor attention. And often they follow uh, strategies that tend to be, as I said, thematic, strategic, very niche, uh, very tied into what's happening right now. Thanks, Charles. Uh, Want to look for the February 2021 issue of the AAI Journal at aaii.com slash journal, which of course features the annual mutual fund and ETF guide. And that does include uh, tables and associated spreadsheets. Up next, our interview with Shelly Antonevich. Shelly, could you explain the, the similarities and differences between a mutual fund and an ETF? Sure, thanks. Um, 
you know, there are a lot of similarities between mutual funds and ETFs, but there are also very key differences. Um, so first, let's go over the similarities, because some of your viewers may not be as familiar with the ETF structure, but they probably know what a mutual fund is. So let's talk about how ETFs are similar to mutual funds. Um, first off, ETFs and mutual funds offer investors a diversified pool of assets. Um, so there are real assets backing those ETF shares and the mutual fund shares. Now those assets can be comprised of stocks, bonds, derivatives, some exposure to commodities, um, different types of assets, but there are real assets backing those shares. Um, another key similarity is that when you buy shares of a mutual fund and you buy shares of an ETF, you have a claim against the assets in that pool for both the mutual fund and the ETF. Um, and then both ETFs and mutual funds offer access. So they will give you access to specific markets. Say you want domestic equity exposure, exposure to the S&P 500 or a broad market index you can get that. You can get exposure to international equity, emerging market equity. You can get exposure to fixed income securities and a whole different array of types of bonds. Um, and as well, you can get access to different strategies, both in mutual funds and ETFs. So for instance, if you want an absolute return fund, you can find one in a mutual fund. You can find one in an ETF as well. Um, another similarity is both products, mutual funds and ETFs, post what's called a net asset value. That is the value of the shares at the end of the day at four o'clock. And that value is based on what the value is of the underlying securities held by both the ETF and the mutual fund. Now, this is where we're gonna get into some of the differences, okay? So when you buy a mutual fund share, the price you pay is that net asset value that's posted at those 4 p.m. prices. As an individual investor, when you buy an ETF share, you are going into the secondary market on the stock exchange because ETF shares trade on the stock exchange, mutual fund shares don't. And you will pay the prevailing market price for that ETF share. Now, let me give you an example. I can buy a mutual fund share at 10 a.m. I can submit the order to buy a mutual fund share at 10 a.m. Okay, my shares will actually be purchased later on at the 4 p.m. net asset value price for that mutual fund. When I submit an order to buy an ETF share at 10 a.m., my order is going to go into the stock market and I am going to buy the prevailing price at 10 a.m. That, will, that may not necessarily be what the net asset value is of that ETF share at the 4 p.m. price. Okay. So it is going to be very close to what the value of the underlying assets are. So say I'm holding a stock ETF. So my, the price I pay for that ETF will be pretty close to what the value is of the underlying shares at 10 a.m. Okay. So that's a difference there, right? Um, the other difference is that in order to get these ETF shares, you have to have a brokerage account. It's the only way that you can, can go into the stock market and submit orders is through a brokerage account. Um, so another uh, difference that you have is, is um, you need to be careful when you're thinking between a mutual fund and an ETF about the fact that you are now taking on the responsibility for doing the trading. So you have to understand putting in different order types for ETFs, um, the time of day that you're trading. So you need to, to do a little bit of research. In a mutual fund, you would, in a sense, outsource that. You've outsourced that to the portfolio manager. When you were talking about buying ETFs, you mentioned that you buy it during the trading day, uh, but you also mentioned the NAV with mutual funds. Could you explain, uh, I guess with ETFs, are you always buying at the net asset value or does that price differ a little bit if you're buying on an intraday basis? 
So that's a really good question. Um, because you are buying an ETF share on the stock exchange and it's trading continuously during the day, that price is going to adjust on the ETF share. And, and there's two reasons why that price adjusts uh, during the trading day. And the primary reason is because the value of the underlying securities in the underlying market are also trading continuously during the trading day. Um, and that will have an impact on the price of the ETF. So if the value of the underlying securities rises, you will see the price of the ETF rise right, in line. Right? Now, there's a second force also that impacts the price of ETF shares. ETF shares are subject to their own demand and supply, and that does have an impact on their price. So say you go in at 10 a.m. and the price of the assets that are being held by the ETF is right here. Okay. Now there's a lot of demand for this ETF shares at 10 a.m. What's going to happen is even though the price of the ETF is aligned, when there is an upsurge in demand for that ETF share, the price of the ETF could rise above where the value of the underlying assets are. What we call here is that the ETF is trading at a premium. Right. When the, say that we're aligned and there's not very much demand for the ETF share, there's very little demand, okay? the price of the ETF share could drift below the value of the underlying securities. We say that the ETF share is trading at a discount to its net, to its underlying value or what we like to call the intrinsic value. Um, so you can, when you go in to purchase your ETF share, you could end up buying it at a premium. You could end up buying it at a discount to its intrinsic value. Now there are forces in play, market forces in play called an arbitrage mechanism. And there are proprietary trading firms out there that are watching these gaps and they're taking trades to align the ETF shares back to their intrinsic value. So if it is a very calm day in the market, there's no stress events going on, the ETF price is going to be trading very, very close to its intrinsic value. Right. And there is a perception among some investors that ETFs are more tax efficient than mutual funds. Uh, but my understanding is there's more to the story than just the fund structure as regards to how much, how, what type of taxable events a fund may generate. Could you yes. uh, explain? Sure, sure. So, you know, first off, a lot of ETFs, the vast majority of ETFs are index based. So they are natu they naturally have lower turnover. And because they have lower turnover, they're just naturally going to have lower capital gains distributions, okay, or lower capital gains. Um, that's the same with an index mutual fund, you will find that to be the case. Um, all, you know, actively managed funds, because um, they have um, their objective is to provide outperformance from an index, um, they will generally have more turnover, they will have more realized capital gains um, than an index fund, whether it's an ETF or a mutual fund. Now, that said, um, ETFs uh, do have a mechanism in, in which they can minimize capital gains distributions to investors year to year. Um, depending upon their structure. Um, that doesn't mean that you get out of paying the capital gains. In the ETF, the capital gains are completely deferred until you would sell that share. Then you would pay the whole entire amount on the capital gains. In the mutual fund, you would pay capital gains distributions every year as the fund has realized capital gains. So that by the time you get to say the same point in time in which you might sell that ETF share, you would have, um, you would sell, you would have essentially the same tax bill. It's just how you've paid it over time. Great, and what about expense ratios? Is either type of fund cheaper or does it really depend on what you're buying? 
Um, it's going to definitely depend upon what you're buying. So both for uh, ETFs and for mutual funds, indexed products tend to have lower expense ratios. Um, they're following an index. It's a lot cheaper to, you don't have to have all of that research capability, infrastructure behind um, to try to suss out where the undervalued securities might be. Um, so in that sense, indexed products do tend to be um, less expensive in terms of their uh, expense ratios. Um, however, it's not always the case that an ETF, an index ETF is cheaper than a comparable index mutual fund. Um, a lot of it has to do with the size of the fund. So funds that are larger because of their economies of scale will tend to have lower expense ratios. Um, that's just a, a fact, it's just arithmetic. Um, so if you're comparing an ETF and a mutual fund, you wanna make sure that you're comparing apples to apples in terms of um, their investment objective, the securities that they're investing in. Um, and then don't always just assume that the ETF is going to have a lower expense ratio. You really want to, uh, you know, look at that. Great. Thank you, Shelley. I wanted to invite the product manager of AAII's A Plus Investor Investment, Discovery, Analysis, and Tracking Tool Service, Wayne Thorpe, on the program to talk about how to use the quality grade to determine if a stock is attractive. Welcome, Wayne. Hey, Ryan. Thanks for having me. My first question is exactly uh, what are the A plus stock grades and specifically the quality grade? Well, you know, I've been analyzing and picking stocks now for over 20 years. Uh, and what I found what works best for me actually is having an objective framework for analyzing and comparing stocks. Uh, for me personally, I feel that it makes the whole process much more manageable. Uh, these frameworks allow me to compare and analyze stocks. Uh, to help me make more informed decisions. And it also removes any subjective biases uh, that can limit my ability to make rational investment decisions. Uh, so, you know, these ideas, these concepts were one of the driving forces behind uh, AI developing the A plus stock rates. Um, academic research, uh, along with real world, uh, real money results, have actually shown that there are several investment factors that have generated market beating uh, returns over the long term. Uh, and these factors include growth, value, momentum, uh, estimate revisions, uh, and last, of course, quality. And the, uh, the A-plus stock grades represent a summary of a company's fundamentals. And they give you a quick overview of how a stock rates based on these five investment factors. Um, you know, looking at quality specifically, uh, it's a factor in stock selection and analysis that's a collection of metrics designed to capture those indicators uh, that point to higher quality financials in companies. Okay, so for A plus investor subscribers, they have access to the A plus stock grade screener. How can these filters be used to identify uh, worthwhile stocks? You know, I have to admit when I was working with our tech team uh, a couple of years ago, as we were designing the A plus stock grade screener, I had a feeling that this was probably going to be one of the real delighters of the A-plus service. Uh, and I'm, I'm pleased to say that based on user stats and feedback, it seems to have lived up to that billing. Um, but, you know, whether you're a value investor, a momentum investor, uh, or a little bit of everything, uh, A-plus subscribers can use the stock rate screener to isolate those stocks from our 6,000 plus stock universe with specific A-plus stock grades or grade ranges. Uh, for the five A plus stock rates, uh, those being value, quality, momentum, estimate revisions, and growth. Uh, so, for example, uh, you can look for high quality value stocks. Uh, those would have, uh, you know, high value uh, and high quality grades. Uh, alternatively, you can look for value stocks that are exhibiting above average price momentum, uh, which actually uh, is a, a favorite of mine when I'm looking for individual stocks. Uh, but no matter what combinations or of grades that I'm looking for, I also tend to require a quality grade or B of or of B or better um, for that little extra level of protection. 
Um, you know, let me point out too that recent enhancements to the A plus stock grade screener now allow you to run grade screens uh, against stocks and portfolios that you might have created using the My, uh, My Portfolio tool, uh, as well as the current passing companies of the AAI stock idea stock screens. Uh, so, so you mentioned the, the quality grade. I was just curious what the underlying variables were for the A plus quality grade. You know, there's no standard definition of quality uh, regarding an agreed upon uh, set of variables. Uh, this stands in contrast to factors such as value or, or even size, which do tend to have clear and generally accepted uh, definitions. So when we were putting together and developing the A plus quality grade, we reviewed uh, numerous academic studies, uh, as well as looked at successful factor-based mutual funds and ETFs to arrive at the eight variables that do encompass the A plus quality grade. And these variables are return on assets, uh, return on investment capital, uh, gross profit to assets, buyback yield, change in total liabilities to assets, accruals, the Z double prime bankruptcy risk variable, and lastly, the F score. And uh, these variables cover uh, a number of elements, including profitability, uh, accounting quality, capital structure and safety that can impact the overall success of a company. Of course, these being grades, much like in school, there's a range, right? A, B, C, D, and F. Uh, just because a stock has a lower quality grade, does that mean you should automatically disqualify it from your portfolio? You know, I'm probably gonna give you a little bit of a, a cop-out answer, but uh, unfortunately the A plus stock grades, uh, the quality grade and investing in particular, uh, and specifically just aren't that clear cut. Uh, you know, part of this has to do with the idea or the issue of good companies versus good investments. Uh, a company may be good, meaning that it's fundamentally sound, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be a good investment at that time. Uh, likewise, a company might not be fundamentally sound, but it still may be a good investment at that particular point in time if the market deems it so. Uh, this is especially true uh, in the short term where a company's fundamentals don't necessarily play a bigger role in price activity. Uh, the A-plus stock grades, uh, especially the quality grade, try to address whether a company is fundamentally good, uh, but it's not a perfect system. Uh, it is, however, an objective, systematic means of evaluating a company. Uh, the factors on which each of these grades are built are based on academic research, uh, including those used for the quality grade. Uh, you know, these studies, as well as real world investment performance, have shown that historically anyway, uh, they have been successful at identifying companies that outperform the market over the long term. Uh, that is not to say, however, though, that a company that has all A grades are going to perform well, uh, especially in the long term, uh, just as it mean, doesn't necessarily mean that a company that has Fs across the board will perform poorly. Uh, but we do feel uh, that on average and in the long run, uh, higher grade stocks will perform lower graded stocks. Uh, and actually, as we were developing this, uh, we did uh, the, uh, the quality grade, we did some back testing. And we found that over the 20 year back testing period, uh, stocks uh, did progressively better as you went from F to D, uh, D to C, C to B and B to A. Uh, and in fact, uh, over the back testing period from 1998 to 2019, uh, stocks with quality grades of A uh, outperformed those uh, with F quality grades uh, by more than two to one. Um, and just want to also just touch on briefly uh, as I wrap things up uh, that, you know, not only does picking stocks with higher quality grades tend to yield uh, better performance, at least based on our back testing results, but quality especially is also useful as an exclusionary filter. Um, you know, there's a lot has been, re uh, a lot has been written about that you can actually use quality uh, to avoid stocks actually with lower quality grades. Uh, and doing so can help you prevent, uh, prevent you from investing in stocks that historically will probably have poor performance or poor track records based on historical uh, back testing. But I just want to say that, you know, for me personally, uh, for my own investing, as well as managing the stock superstars uh, report portfolio, I do tend to avoid stocks with F quality grades based on uh, this is based on our historical back testing. Uh, but that is a personal choice. And uh, just as kind of a last point of fact, the uh, these grades are updated. Uh, how frequently? 
Uh, they as they are upgraded actually daily. Uh, we run a data process after every day, after the trading day, uh, every trading day, uh, and those grades are updated then uh, the following morning. Great. Well, I appreciate your time today, Wayne. Uh, I'd like to invite folks if you can, uh, if you want to find out more about how you can become an A plus investor, you can visit aai.com/plus. You'll get access to a bunch of tools, including the A plus stock grade screener, and uh, find out more about those uh, differing grades. And now for our listener mailbag segment, where we address questions that you have been submitted by viewers and members, and answer them here. If you have a question for us, you can submit them using the questions panel in your GoToWebinar control panel, or you can email me rreeh -E at aaii.com with the subject line II show question. All right, Charles, these questions came in and I wanted to have you answer them. This one comes in from Ira H. Uh, his question, uh, is there any truth to the notion that a cash brokerage account is safer than a margin one? Supposedly, if you have a margin account, the broker can lend out your shares to short sellers, which means that the broker is margined, whereas stocks and cash accounts are inaccessible to brokers to lend them out? So yes, there is truth to that. So in a traditional order, we tend to buy the stocks, hold them, and then sell them. With a short sell, we're actually flipping that. So we're selling the stock first and then buying it back. So the question obviously is, well, how am I going to sell something I don't own? And what happens is the short sellers borrow the share. So they typically are large institutional investors will go to the broker and say, hey, I want to borrow X number of, of stock XYZ or a, ABC. So the broker will lend those shares. Now the broker holds some inventory. So the broker can lend shares out of their own inventory, or they can look at their clients and say, okay, which clients hold the stock in their margin account? So in that case, the broker might go to your account and say, hey, you're holding stock XYZ in your margin account. We're going to lend out those shares. So that automatically puts you at what's known as counter, uh, puts you at risk of counterparty risk, which means the firm that borrowed the part of the shares, they're now obliged to return the shares. And if something happens and they're unable to immediately return the shares, you might have a situation where you actually cannot get those shares. Say you want to part with those shares, you want to pull your money out, sell the shares, get your cash out, all of a sudden the shares may not be available to you. So there's always that risk with margin accounts. Now, with a lot of brokers, you can say, don't hold these certain shares in my margin account. I want to hold them in my cash account. Um, I would encourage investors to actually talk with a broker, read the rules and disclaimers involving the handling of margin accounts carefully. Um, and in general, tread carefully with margin because while margin which is essentially borrowing can give you extra returns it can also result in larger losses so it's a very dangerous tool and a very high risk tool to be involved with i can imagine that question kind of came up with the uh, gamestop situation and, and other stocks um you know a lot of people asking questions about options and short sales and whatnot absolutely um, so this other question came in from Thomas T. He asks, do the AAII screens and portfolios use stop loss protection at all? And I guess if you could just briefly define what stop loss protection is for folks. Sure, absolutely. So stop loss means you're going to sell a stock if it either falls by a certain percentage point or you're going to, it's going to fall by a certain price. So say you have a stock that's trading at $50. You can say, well, I'm going to sell a stock and the, drops, the price drops 20%, which means it would drop to $40. Or you can say, if the stock falls below $40, I'm going to sell it. You can't actually put a stop limit order in your account to sell a stock. Now, with, there's, there's actually two parts to this question. So first of all, uh, the member asked about our stock screens. Our stock screens are essentially database filters. Uh, we're basically telling our screening tools to go identify stocks with these specific characteristics. So the returns we show for our stock screens and they're just based on all the stocks passing the screen on a given month being held for a full calendar month. That's not actual portfolios. Our model, port our model portfolios, our model shadow stock portfolio, our dividend investing, our stock superstars, our VMQ, those are actual portfolios run through real money brokerage accounts. So the returns you see for, for those four model portfolios are actually our actual returns factoring in all our transaction costs and commissions when those were applied. 
now with our portfolios, we don't use hard and fast stop limits. Now, some of our portfolios, though, we do take them into account. For instance, our stock superstars portfolio, with certain strategies, we do consider how far a stock has actually dropped, such as a such as our group one strategy, which uses the O'Neill. Uh, in our VMQ stocks portfolio, we have a momentum indicator. So if a stock price really weakens, we'll see a momentum indicator flashing, hey, the stock has very weak price momentum. Uh, conversely, in our shadow stock portfolio, we don't use a stop limit because we found at least the excess transactions. Uh, when you're investing in these very small micro cap companies, uh, you're actually better off having fewer transactions than not. So we do pay attention overall to price performance. We have a big drop. We do investigate why. Is there something going on with the company? Uh, but we don't, as a general rule, have these hard and fast stop loss limits that we just say if a stock falls X percent, it's automatically out of a portfolio. Our process is more nuanced and we rely heavily on the buy and sell rules we use to govern all of our portfolios. Great. Well, uh, thank you for answering those questions and uh, thanks to our members who sent those in. Again, if you have a question for us, you can submit them using the questions panel in your GoToWebinar control panel, or you can email me. Uh, the address should be shown on the screen below, but it's rreeh at aaii.com with the subject line II show question. We will get them on air for the next show. Thanks. If you liked our show, please visit aaii.com slash webinars to register for more great webinar and video content. You can also like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at aaii underscore invest underscore ed. For more investing education, I invite you to check out our website, aaii.com. Again, I want to thank our guests, Charles Roblet and Wayne Thorpe of AAII and Shelley Antonevich of the Investment Company Institute. And of course, all of our listeners and viewers for listening. We'll see you next time.